Ed Piscor here. Jim Rugg. There was a Three Rivers Comic Con uh, in my neighborhood, my neck of the woods, and we ran down there. We kidnapped Ron Friends, <laughs> classic, legendary comic artist, and we decided, why not put him underneath the uh, hot lights, get a shoot interview for the Cartoonist Kayfabe channel. R Ron, I want to thank you for coming, first it's off. It's my pleasure, guys. Happy to be here. Of a certain generation, the story's the same. Like, we all drew comics when we were kids, blah, 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 blah. Right. Uh, we, we, you know, we spent all our time reading comics, all of that. So let's skip that part and... One of the most interesting things about you in your career, to me, is the fact that you are basically a Pittsburgh guy, like mm -hmm. Western PA. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And I don't know that it was that common for a person who wasn't in New York City to really break into the field. So the initial question I have for you is how, like, what was the trajectory for you to get into the game? Because the common wisdom would have probably have been... Do do a, a stretch at some fanzines, do some Apple work or something, and then you work your way up and you get your first gig. So so how did that happen? Well, I can I could see where you would think that. I yeah I always pictured breaking in being that I had to you know buy a bus ticket and go to New York and show up at the offices and show them portfolio pieces and everything. The offices came to me. Jim Shooter also is a Pittsburgh guy, and he was doing a shop appearance at uh, Ides on. Uh, was it Federal Street in the north side? The one was right by the bridge? Yeah, for sure. And uh, he was doing a shop appearance there and a signing. And I brought my portfolio down. I had friends there that, God love them, they threatened me within an inch of my life that if I didn't take the opportunity to show Shooter this stuff, that they were going to break my legs. Uh, before that, at a, uh, I think it was a Monroeville show, I had had the incredible opportunity to talk to Marie Severin, and she gave me a critique of my stuff, and it was very positive. And she even then said, you should go find Jim Shooter and get a simple plot and, and do some storytelling. And at that point, I froze and was scared and wasn't ready, so I didn't do that. But once I was at the Art Institute, and, and I, as you're saying, a lot of us probably did this, uh, friends had their own characters and everything, so instead of doing my own characters... I would work with their characters and kind of tell a story. Their and characters meaning uh, Marvel the comic book characters. No, uh, there being other friends of mine I who were doing their own their own characters and stuff, and it, it gave me uh, you know less of a of an excuse to just do whatever I wanted to do. And you know, I talked about an origin story with this one guy who had a character called the Pariah, and I developed some other supporting characters and we we put it on paper and those those were basically along with like a three-page sequence that was in the old foom magazine that was like a sample spider-man plot uh those were the sample pages that i showed jim shooter i look back on them now they were light on backgrounds they were you know technically were a mess but he liked the dynamics of it he liked the figure work of it because even then i was a big uh basama devotee and and so there was a lot of that in there and he uh, liked it enough that he wanted to take the Xeroxes back to New York and show it to his editors, and and he did. I mean, they sat in a drawer for like a year, um, and I was working in an animation studio, uh, Anavision, uh, out in Castle Shannon, and finally got a call from my mom at the studio that Alan Milgram had called uh, the house and wanted to talk to me, and, and he handed the phone to Louise Jones, who wanted to hire me to do a uh, Kesar fill-in, and I'm only half joking when I say they went through, they went into a file of people we may use someday. They needed somebody to do a fill-in for Kesar, and the sample pages I had done were mercenaries in a South American jungle. So there were a couple of big leaves and yeah, stuff. Yeah, you could drop you know. some foliage. <laughs> and they and, and they said, "How about this guy?" You know that kind of thing. Um, I don't I don't think it was any more involved than that, to tell you the God's honest truth. But the, the, that. I turned it around quickly, even though I was working on a 9-to-5, because the, my boss at the animation studio, Rick Catazone, had no problem with me. If we weren't busy on a project for the studio, he had no problem with me working on my Marvel stuff during office hours. So I was able to turn that first job around. They liked it enough that they offered me the job before it. My The first job I penciled was KSR 17, then they offered me 16, and I went... Okay, <laughs> and and then they I, there was like a King Conan job that I did, and and they offered me King Conan, but that was a giant size book every month, I think, or maybe quarter, maybe bi monthly. What do you I'm mean sure. giant size? It what was kind of page it count? was it was a larger page count, mm -hmm. but they offered me that as a regular gig, 
And I turned it down because I still wanted to keep my job at the animation studio. Um, and then they offered me KSAR, and I took it <laughs> because I was afraid they'd stop offering things. Um, so I, I, I took KSAR. I went from KSAR to like some Indiana Jones fill-ins to Star Wars. I mean, early on, I was actually scared I wasn't going to get to do superheroes because I, I wanted to do spandex. So from the time I was six or seven, I wanted to grow up, work for Marvel Comics, and draw Spider-Man. He was, you know. You had to go through uh, Chris Star to get there. I had to, I had to go through, yeah. But I was doing <laughs> these fill-ins for like adventure characters. Yeah. And I'm like, am I ever going to get to do superheroes? And Spider-Man showed up in KSAR. Tom DeFalco was the editor of Marvel Team Up at the time. He saw the Spider-Man. He said, well, it looks like what, you know, he's doing a Ramita Spider-Man. He's doing a solid Spider-Man. So he hired me to do Marvel Team Up. Uh, that was briefly, very briefly, a regular gig. And, uh, and you know, it kind of worked the way it's supposed to work. You know, you do your, you pay a few dues. You get somebody, you, you get to do Spider-Man. Somebody sees it and hires you to do more Spider-Man. And that kind of led to, you know, and once I was offered Spider-Man, that's when I left the animation studio. I was, I what, you know, if I was going to take the book, which I I didn't feel ready, but I also knew that anybody else they hired, one, it would break my heart, and two, they weren't going to give one hundred ten percent like I was. So I I jumped in with both feet, and I also figured, you know, how much more stable is a life as a freelance comics illustrator going to be than doing the Spider-Man Monthly. <laughs> So that was at that point I uh, left the animation studio and uh, went you, into comics full time. You said you were uh, at the Art Institute of Pittsburgh. Yes. I think you're probably a bit younger than Paul Galacy, but he went to the Art Institute of he, Pittsburgh for he, a minute too. He did, yes, and well, I, 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 it was uh, before I was there. I remember when I was there, they would talk about Paul. If they knew you were interested in comics, they would talk about. He was Paul. the go-to guy. Yeah, in fact, when I was in high school, when I was at my Votech, and they came to do the talk for Art Institute, they would hold up a Shang Chi comic, uh, <laughs> you know, and say Paul Galacy went to this, and I went. <laughs> Uh, it's not by Paul Galacy. Uh, that's awesome. <laughs> it was like a Ron Wilson issue or something, you know, and it's like, what are you doing, man? Come on. One one other Pittsburgh question. Mm -hmm. um, there were the Avengers issues that were plotted by the Pittsburgh Comics Club. Uh, I was aware of them, yeah. But you weren't yeah. a part of that? I was never, no. I had friends who were a part of the Pittsburgh Comics Club, and I went to some of those early shows when I was in high school. Uh, but and, and at the Art Institute, I became very good friends with people who had been a part of the comics club but i never I, i've never been much of a joiner to tell you the god's honest truth. yeah i hear you so i didn't actually join the comics club formally in any way um i uh, there was one of the shows it would have been the 70 i graduated high school in 78 so seven, at 79 80 there was a show that i did some promotional artwork for some promotional flyers for and stuff and worked on the program book through Andy Sands, who was very involved with it at the time. Who yeah. was, uh, That's a name that comes up in, yeah. in, in Pittsburgh comic book lore. Exactly. And <laughs> uh, so I, you know, in fact, I was working one day, one night doing paste up and some lettering and, and some artwork for the program booklet when Stephen King came to visit the, we were in the offices of Questar Magazine. We were at a production desk in Questar Magazine and uh, Stephen King came in to, to do a, a quick tour of the place and I never looked up from what I was doing because we were trying to get it done. And, you know, Andy was like, you know, that was Stephen King. And I went, did he know it was Ron Friends? <laughs> <laughs> I, I said, I, I'm sorry I didn't look up. I, I would have recognized him, you know, but uh, I hope he wasn't offended. So. Ron, I'm curious about sort of the workings of Marvel at, at the time, okay. you know, that, that we're talking about mid-80s approximately, early to mid-80s. Uh, 82, 83, yeah. I'm curious yeah. about everything. Are you lobbying for Spider-Man? Do you make known, like... Nope these are the books I want to do, or these are nope. favorite characters? It's no. just kind of random that it... It was, well, I don't know how random it was, because like I said, behind the scenes, people are noticing the work you're doing. And they're, you know, obviously Tom DeFalco saw the Spider-Man appearance in KSAR and said he didn't screw up the character. You know, he didn't, he, he didn't ruin uh, Stan and Steve's dream or anything like that. <laughs> so it's like, I'll keep that kid in mind for team up. And then, you know, you... you become familiarized with the character and you become a, a, any, any way associated with the character. I mean, because I did a, a, like a Peter Parker fill-in and the kid who collects Spider-Man, that was, that was not done uh, 
I believe that was still prior to me being hired on the regular book. Because even when I was hired on Spider-Man, it was an, as an interim guy. Right. Uh, Ramita Jr. was going to, uh, to leave Spider-Man just for like six months to get the X-Men up and running and then do both books, if you can imagine that. Yeah. Um, and I was just hired to do the six issues. And, and Danny, liked, uh, Danny Fingeroth liked what Tom and I were doing. And uh, you know, at one point was talking to, to JR and... You know, he was saying, you know, are you really coming back? Because, you know, these guys are kind of gelling. And he goes, you sound happy with them? And he said, yeah, I am. And he said, yeah, just give it to them. I, I, X-Men's more than enough for one illustrator, you know. And when I first met JR at a convention, I thanked him for my run on Spider-Man, you know. Cause, uh, but we went through a lot of editorial change. Just in the two or th two and a half years I was on the book, we went through a lot of editorial changes and the situation shifted greatly. Yeah, I'm, I'm curious about that too, like how creative teams... You know, do you have influence on inkers or colorists, uh, opinions on at, them at as the you're working? You have, you're always allowed to express opinions. Um, when I got into the business, editors were much more a part of the creative process. They were uh, probably a little more so than even in some cases they should have been because I would have conversations. Uh, Pat Olive and I had a couple of conversations with different editors where they said, yeah, I have no idea how to pair an inker with a penciler. And yet, <laughs> you know, our work depends on it, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, but uh, so, you're, you know, your opinions were certainly welcome. But, I mean, back then, maybe more so than, a, than now, I can't really speak to that. I mean, the deadline was, the, the dreaded deadline doom was a real thing. You were producing a product that had to get out monthly, or they were going to run a reprint of Millie the Model. I mean, there, there was no, you know... There was no just letting the retailers know it was going to be out two months later instead of when we promised it. It just wasn't going to happen. So, I mean, there were a few times where I came, you know, dangerously close to shipping. I think I think we missed shipping once or twice. I probably went on my seven years of Thor. What do you think your quickest turnaround had to be, like in a crunch emergency situation? Oh God, we 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 did some really ridiculous. Two things. weeks. Uh, for a, for a book, job. oh, easy for a pencil job, easy. To, uh, Pat Olive and I at one point, uh, Lee Weeks, the great Lee Weeks, had to have a uh, drop out of a Spider Man three three issue miniseries at the eleventh hour for one reason or another. I'm sure they were legitimate because Lee's terrific. Uh, Ralph Macchio was completely. I mean, thing was on the schedule. I mean, you know, again, you didn't just call the retailers and say, "Oh, yeah, that's, that's not going to happen." Um, like they can now. And uh, so Ralph contacted, uh, I forget who he contacted, me or Pat Olla for both of us. We were sharing studio space at the time. And he was up against it. He, we had to produce three issues in, it felt like, like, a, like a month and a half or something like that. It was nuts. And I was, I mean, I was penciling pages and handing them to Pat and he was inking them. To, to the point where there are no Xeroxes of my pencils. I mean, we didn't have time to run to a Kinko's or anything. You know, it was just getting the pages out. And one of the reasons we did it was Ralph was the Spider-Man editor. And you want to, you know, do what you can to ingratiate yourself to editors and everything. And wouldn't you know it, we, we cranked it out. It's not the worst stuff I ever did. It actually looks pretty good overall. And, uh, like, literally the week after we turned it in, Ralph wasn't the Spider-Man editor anymore and somebody else had been hired and Ralph moved on to other projects and Pat and I kind of looked at each other and just kind of went, <sighs> but, uh, <laughs> that was crazy. But I, I really, as far as, um, I remember doing 10 pages of basically breakdowns, not a lot of character to the line, kind of open stuff. And, uh, it didn't have a lot of background because of the situation, uh, uh like 10 pages of Star Wars in a day. Um, it was, uh, it, it was a situation where he, Luke was on a water world where there was like wreckage from some structures that had been there that were hit by a giant tidal wave. So it was like flotsam and jetsam on the water and he was on the larger pieces of wreckage. So it was a lot of clouds and, you know, and water and a little bit of wreckage and stuff and the figure work. And uh, I remember turning out 10 pages in a day and somebody telling me, you know, congratulations. And I said, for what? I mean, it's, it's a deadline, you know. And he said, there was, and this is going to sound like I'm being self-aggrandizing and, uh, and falsely modest, but somebody said that was the Kirby barrier or some <laughs> BS like that. I'm going, what? 
And he goes, Jack used to do, you know, 10 pages in a day. And I said, have you ever seen Jack Kirby's pages? Because I'm sure they weren't Luke Skywalker on a platform <laughs> with water and clouds. You know, that kind of thing. But it was, uh, you know, yeah. I did go to breakdowns pretty quickly uh, working professionally. Marvel pretty pretty quickly recognized what they liked about my stuff was the storytelling. What they really wanted to utilize was the storytelling, which was gratifying. Um, I didn't really start full penciling until I was hired on Spider-Man, and that only lasted a couple of months because Joe Rubenstein was more comfortable as a finisher. And he went to the editor and said, you know, could Ron go to breakdowns? And, uh, and Danny Fingeroth, the editor, said, no, Joe, I hired him to do full pencils. He's going to do full pencils. And I'm going, Danny, that's a waste of effort. I mean, it's, it's a waste for me to do full pencils when you got a finisher like Joe Rubenstein, who his look is going to ultimately be the look of the book. Anyway, it's, it's like doing full pencils for Tom Palmer. You know, I mean, the look is going to be what he's going to be doing. So I, was, I volunteered to go to breakdowns again. Can you uh, just briefly to the audience out there who might not be familiar with the difference between breakdowns okay. and full pencils? Sure. Well, full pencils are what they, you, where you're filling in all the blacks. It's a complete illustration. Uh, you know, if you went in with a computer and maybe leveled out some of the pencil strokes, it would look like a complete and finished illustration. Breakdowns can be anything from uh, a circle that says Spider-Man <laughs> to what I would mostly do would be, uh, again, open figures with very little character to the line. And if there was a larger shadowy area, I would just put like X's in it and things like that to let to indicate to the inker that that was blacks. But but the inker was adding the character of the of the line and, and the any feathering and, and shading and things like that. Uh, that would that was mostly what I would do. And and I actually mine apparently were tight enough. Inkers at that time often were considered finishers. Guys like Tom Palmer, Terry Austin, uh, Joe Rubenstein, Brett Breeding, uh, were you know incredibly talented at taking breakdowns and turning them into finished product, and it, it really was more of an attitude of you know if you do breakdowns you get on to the next job and and on and on and on and it, again production was always the king, uh, moving the production line along. So uh, yeah, I, I did. I, I had plenty of inkers say, but everything's there. You know, if you've seen like really loose John Buscema breakdowns, some of them become a little more open for translation and looser and and they're legitimate and all the storytelling is there. But my stuff was tight enough that, you know, there, there was less question to expression and how things were, you know, attitudes of characters and things like that. So I had several inkers along the way say, well, you should get full pencils. And I go, oh, absolutely not. I'm not, I'm not going to accept full pencils for this because I'm, I'm taking advantage of the fact that the anchor is a finisher and knowing that that's my attitude, I'm not going to vouch for something that I don't feel honest about. And it wasn't until somewhere in the Thor run, I did full pencils on like Thor 400 because I, we didn't know who was going to ink it. And Joe Sinnott inked it. Yeah. And Joe Sinnott did a fantastic job. But he kept more of my full pencils than I was expecting. And, you know, because Joe Sinnott's one of those guys where you could, like, sit back and just do breakdowns. You could probably just do the circle and put four, and, you know, he could do it. But I found myself so gratified that he was sticking with what I was doing, and I was trying to do that Kirby pastiche and everything. So so I stayed, in, I stayed a little more engaged with the pencils on that. And, you know, and now I, I fill in my blacks and everything for Sal, uh, when I working with Salva Samo on Spider Girl, he insisted that I take full pencils, and I said, "Okay, but now you're gonna have to deal with the graphite because I can't vouch for full pencils. If it's a large black area, I'll put the X's, but I can't do full pencils without adding the line character and blacks on hair and all that kind of stuff, you know. And uh, and I've so ever since Spider Girl, like on Blue Baron and projects I do now, I I pretty much full pencil everything." Were you working Marvel Method on Spider-Man and, yeah. uh, and Thor? Yes. Can you talk um, a little bit about that? Sure, sure. My, my first exposure uh, working professionally was a little interesting and unique because on Kesar, Bruce Jones was the writer, and he was writing short stories. He, would, he was formatting them like short stories. There was very little page. I don't think there was any page count. He was just telling a 22-page short story. 
And so it was completely up to me as a new penciler to pace it and do, and in the thumbnailing stage. But once I started working with, uh, you know, seasoned comics guys, yeah, the Marvel method was very much in in place. And what the Marvel method is is, it, it's far more formal than it was when it was christened. It's from what I understand, Stan would sometimes just have a conversation with people and all that kind of stuff. DeFalco always typed up a plot and would break it down into page groupings and things like that and help me structure it. And But they always also came, I mean, Tom and I realized early on that we enjoyed the same kind of comics, so it always came after a long conversation about the characters and what was going on in the story, and I was able to contribute if I had something to contribute. And it was a, a wonderful hand-in-glove experience. I... To this day, I miss anything creatively. I mean, Tom's the other half of my brain, you know, and uh, uh, it, it was, I, I'm the luckiest guy in the world. I mean, I got to work at Marvel, but in some of the situations that were just ideal. I mean, my seven years on Thor, I woke up every morning know, knowing that these were the good old days, you know. I mean, I, I appreciated every every minute because we were on that book long enough that we went through different phases. We introduced different characters and, you know, had Eric become Thor and then introduced Thunderstrike. And this is wildly creative. Uh, and MC2, our little run with uh, with uh, the, the Spider-Girl books, the Spider-Girl family of books, was just, I mean, it was like being a kid, doing your own fan stuff, you know, I mean, because we weren't, trapped in the Marvel continuity. We didn't have to answer to any other editors or any other creators, and we were just having a gas. And I honestly think that our our fans, the fans we do have, I think that one of the things they recognize is that element of fun that I, I think it can't help but come through on the page if the creative people are engaged in, in having fun. I can vouch for it. Yeah. Uh, like I... In these long boxes is a pretty substantial Thor run that you and DeFalco yeah. did. And, and uh, you know, at the time, I'm a boy in the very early 90s, but I'm, like, going through back issues, and that's where I'm getting, like, the earliest stuff. And compare that to these, um, you know, post-Dark Knight Return superheroes right. where they try to inject all this pathos and stuff. Right. And that right. was more traditionally of, like, what I imagine comics to be. Like, before really reading comics, it's like, yeah, like, it should be kind of bombastic, mm -hmm. like, high fantasy um, I certainly agree with that. I mean, I, I comics should be an escape. I mean, I, I can appreciate the craft in something darker. But and, and when I was younger, I probably liked it more than I enjoy it now. But uh, yeah, I mean, comics to me are they do a particular thing very well. I mean, comics are is an incredible, incredibly elastic medium. I mean, they can be movies, they can be graphic movies, but they don't have to be. You know, I mean, they, they, there's, uh, there is that specific sweet spot of the Stanley uh, Jack Kirby Fantastic Four or, or the, the, the Jack Kirby Stanley Thor that is this amazing, you know, when you combine it with the work of Will Eisner and everything, it's an amazing lesson in what comics does better than any other medium. I mean, as much as you love going to a Marvel movie and seeing what they can do with CGI now and all that kind of stuff. I mean, that's one of the most basic questions I was ever asked in an interview was, why do you think the Marvel movies are such a big hit now? Why do you think now? And I said, CGI. <laughs> I mean, they couldn't do them before. Now they can do them. They can actually do what we used to do on the comic book page, which was create a visual for anything you could imagine, you know. Um, and, and that's the bottom line. But, you know, the thing that I miss from the movies that was still part of the alchemy of a comic is, I used to illustrate it this way, if, if you have five rabid Spider-Man fans that read Spider-Man every month and know Ditko's work and know Ramita's work and know whatever's going on in the books, and you ask those five people, okay, who should play Peter Parker? You will get five widely disparate answers of actors who should play Peter Parker. I mean, back in the day, you know, I always thought Tom Hanks from Bosom Buddies would be a great Peter Parker. But people were saying, Ray Liotta should play Peter Parker and all this, and it just made me go, hmm. I mean, these people are all looking at the same graphic interpretation of this character, and yet there's still this huge part of it that's being filled in by their imaginations. That, that you know, They're doing, it's engaging you to do some of the work. And that 
that can't be accomplished in a movie. That part of the alchemy isn't, you know, the movie is what the movie is, and it's showing you, uh, you know, a, a, it's not requiring you to sit there and go, I wonder what that would sound like. I wonder what that would feel like. And, and comics, whether you know it or not, at the time you're reading it, is, is asking that of you. It's requiring that of you. And, and I find that fascinating. I really do. Because I hardly ever agree with people when they start casting these these films, and I think Marvel has done an incredible job with casting uh, Captain America and Thor and Tony Stark and all that kind of stuff, and to varying levels. I mean, Chris Evans is obviously playing the Cap that we've known in the books. Robert Downey Jr. invented the Tony Stark that we see in the movies, and the books have followed suit. You know that kind of thing. So I don't know. Did I get off track? I got off track. We'll get it back on the rails, man. Okay, get it back on the rails. Ed mentioned, uh, you know, 1986, Dark Knight, comics right. of this sort. Right. Are you reading comics at that point? Yes. You know, you're a couple years into your career, probably working a lot. I, I was still reading and staying engaged up through Mike Mignola's Hellboy. I was a huge fan of that. Up in, uh, you know, even uh, the stuff he did with, uh, I'm going to screw up the guy's name, Duncan. Fredrida. Uh, Fagredo, Duncan Fagredo. I mean, I loved his work. Uh, you know, so I, I was up through the Wild Hunt and everything. I was always following Hellboy, and I was reading some of the Buffy comics, and I was still paying attention. Anytime I was producing anything for Marvel, I was still making it out to the comic shops on a fairly monthly basis. But uh, I'm just not anymore, unfortunately. Did you get a sense that, that comics audiences were changing at that time sure. in the late 80s? Sure. I mean, I was seeing it in all kinds of ways. Some ways that were disappointing to me and then other ways that were you know, well that's that's what happens you know um i you certainly it was hard not to recognize the kind of stuff that frank miller was doing and the reaction was getting from outside the comics readership and everything but what would disappoint me would be when you're getting into the image phase and tom defalco and john basema do a wolverine graphic novel called bloody choices that was one of the best pulp stories I've ever read and one of the best treatments of Wolverine that I've ever read. And I don't say that just because Tom's a friend and Basema's work was amazing in it, very theatrical, very, very wonderful. And I was in a comic shop while some image kids were looking through it, tearing it to shit, not understanding it at all, not caring to understand it at all. And, you know, God love them. I mean, the next generation has no obligation to the generation that came before but you know it makes you want to you know come on son i need to educate you <laughs> you know that kind of thing and i don't remember being like that myself i i don't remember you know being into ramita and dismissing ditko or being into anybody and dismissing eisner or dismissing manili or dismissing Anybody that came before, you know, I mean, even the, when DC was doing the, the 25 cent giants and they were reprinting the old Simon Kirby stuff and everything, the, the life in that work is undeniable. The, the, the craftsmanship and the, and the draftsmanship of that stuff is undeniable. I mean, it, so I, I mean, I get it, but it, it's distressing to me that, and because we're even going through a phase like that now where comics are very static, uh, there are some fantastic illustrators working in this field now, but they're not comics illustrators. Or, and by that, I'm only talking about how I w what the craft I learned and how I was indoctrinated and how you told a dramatic story and everything. And a lot of people who are currently into comics or have gotten into comics in the last five, ten years look at the kind of work I did and find it cartoonish and goofy and over the top and and... I mean, one of the things on Facebook that, uh, you know, as a fan myself, that annoys me is when they take a panel out of context and and, and start rapping on Don Heck or start, you know, uh, uh, trash talking who the writer was and all this kind of stuff. And it's like, you know, this whole thing about like taking 1965 Fantastic Four panels where Reed is a chauvinist and you know, putting it out on Facebook for mocking, mocking and derision and its stuff, and it's like, yeah. And if have you have you ever listened to song lyrics from back then too? You, you, know? you got to find the mute button on Facebook, <laughs> man. Like it, it's going to make your life. Uh, well, it, far but it, better. It, it's it's insightful as far as you know what people are finding, how they're relating to the work, and 
And w what's interesting to me with comics is that you don't... I mean, granted, there are people who are never going to watch Citizen Kane because it's in black and white. No, I get true. it, mm -hmm. you know. But, you know, in comics, it just seems to be like... The, I, I don't remember it being as visceral, the 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 you know, attacking what came before, being as visceral it is, as it is now. I mean, everybody who gets into comics is always going to love the comics that they discovered, right. okay? That's why my my wheelhouse is the late 60s, early 70s. I mean, I, I was living on this stuff then. I was, I, it was a direct infusion, you know. What I find funny about my own career and the way it's being viewed is that when I came in in the 80s, mm. they said I was trying to rediscover the 60s. They said, well, he's doing a 60s pastiche. That was very true. We get into the 90s and the 2000s, and I was accused of being an 80s guy. I'm, I'm trying to bring back the 80s, you know. And, and it, it says as you go like 20 years, they're going 15 years back to, to, to categorize my work, you know. And... Uh, my work hasn't changed that much. I've made adaptation over the years, desperately sure. at times. I mean, I went through a phase on Spider-Girl being so intimidated taking the title over from Pat Olive because I, I, nobody's a bigger Pat Olive fan than I am. He's just one of the most solid draftsmen and illustrators I've, I've ever seen. And my response to that, knowing I couldn't do that. You know, in the same way that Tom DeFalco and I went on Thor, we couldn't do Walt. If you would have, if we would have tried to do Walt Light, it would have been a terrible, terrible mistake, and it would have bombed awfully. So we did what we did, and, you know, we lost some Walt fans, but we were doing really well on the regular newsstand. Yeah, you if, you get, if you get a seven-year bid, man, yeah. uh, you're doing something right. Yeah, we're, well, the, the editor's happy anyway, and the sales are solid. And Yeah, exactly. Um, and so I found myself on Spider Girl, even though I had worked on the original Spider Girl story and had helped launch it, being very intimidated by Pat to the point where I went real far the other direction and got uh, got a little cartoonier in my style. And I started to bring, you know, uh, what I've always loved about certain styles of animation into it. And and I mean, I look back at that stuff now, and you know, I was, people had shovel faces and the figures were very elongated and. Spider Girl got skinnier and skinnier and skinnier until even the girl, the, even the kids that loved the book, the people that supported the book and loved the book, I was seeing you know Spider Girl message board things going. Somebody get this girl a sandwich, you know. And I'm like, okay, maybe I need to step back and be a little more objective. And finally, got to a point where I just said, you know, I, I have to stop living in Pat's shadow because the book is continuing and. It's going to be with me, and you know the, when when we survived the first cancellation after Pat left, I still felt it was based mostly on Pat's work. When we survived the next cancellation, I knew it was because that it was the work I was doing. So you know, slowly I reclaimed the character and stuff. So. That's a pretty interesting couple of moments there, because I, I, I kind of remember this. This is uh, early 2000s or something, and it would be like fan petitions and yeah. and online oh, yeah. campaigns. We have very smart fans. Alive. They were very dedicated to the book. And instead of writing to Marvel and bitching to Marvel, they would write to the retailers. They created their own flyers. They, made it, they, they started a, a campaign to engage the retailers and telling the retailers what a, a loyal fan base this book had, and you would be crazy not to take advantage of it. And and they were, you know, like I said, they were publishing their own flyers, doing uh, Photoshop, publishing their own flyers, using artwork and stuff. And they were they put they were, they were putting their own money behind it. At one point, they were going to start a, a a Kickstarter to just <laughs> keep the book going from their money. And Tom DeFalco said you know, uh, on the Spider Girl message board, "To all of you, thank you." But no, <laughs> we're not doing that. So yeah. I'm a little bit ignorant to this. Like uh, in the in the, it was like Survivor. There was some I, some sort I, of. That's what I'm curious about. Were they tell? Was Marvel? They canceled the book, or they would tell you it's this. Well, the, is the, the end way it worked. Yeah, the way it worked was there. More than once, we were told it was done. Uh, there was one time in particular that we were told, you know, pack it, pack it up. But what ha what the problem was at Marvel. And it's probably still happening now with sales departments and such. Is that when you launch a book, they look at the initial sales and they look at trends. 
you know, like the second issue, and you know, and that's when that's why they're they're now trying to counter that by doing all the variant covers and all this kind of stuff. But back then, before the variant covers became the crutch, the sales department would do a chart, and they would chart the path of your book. It starts with these numbers. It's going to do that. We're going to cancel it at like twelve, twelve or twelve or thirteen. It's probably going to be your last issue. The what what confounded them with Spider Girl is that our sales were that. Mm. They didn't always do that. We had a couple of moments where they did that, where the sales department completely freaked out. That's when they wanted to do the relaunch because the sales were actually doing that. Yeah, get a new number one in there. Right. But we were always doing that, and they didn't know how to deal with that. So constantly, like every two years, we were told, you know, issue 16 is probably going to be your last one. Issue... I, I mean, I'm not good with issue numbers and everything, but uh, there was a time where, you know, Tom DeFalco has said, and he's right, every time, every issue that ended with a splash page with, like, May Day swinging over the city, talking about who she is and why she does what she does was potentially a last issue, <laughs> and, they, and they didn't cancel us, you know, that kind of thing. Um, and, yeah, it was crazy. I mean, I know 60 was one. I, I was, I, Pat left. Because the book was going to be canceled. Mm -hmm. He was told, Tom was told, the book is canceled, you're done. And Pat was offered other work that was that would put him on some very important people's radar. You know. And he 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 hated the idea of leaving Spider Girl. Uh, but they wanted him to start these new projects immediately. So he took them. And I was as surprised as anybody that you know it seemed logical to call the guy who actually launched the character and co-created the character because I wasn't doing anything. But I was as surprised as anybody when they actually did that. And so I, I came on for like the last, I don't know, I don't think even think it was a whole year of books or something because the, the book was heading, I, basically I was coming on just to steer the ship into the dock. And we were canceled. And okay, we're done. Um, and then <laughs> it ended up being an April Fool's Day unfortunately, that DeFalco was called by the office and said, the book's not canceled, we need a plot by, by Tuesday. And he went, yeah, okay, and hung up the phone. <laughs> and that happened like two or three times. And he, he finally called Ralph Macchio, who he assumed was behind the practical joke, and he said, stop it. And he said around 5.30 that afternoon, he got a call from Tom Brevoort, who at the time was executive editor. I'm, I, he's some other, he has some other title now. I think he's editor-in-chief now. But he was like an executive editor, and he said, it's, it's 6 o'clock in the evening. I want to be at home. I don't want to be talking to you on the phone. This is not a joke. Spider-Girl's not canceled. We need a plot by Tuesday. And he went, oh, okay. And he calls me up, and he says, apparently this is really happening. Because he had been checking in during the course of the day saying, these guys are assholes. You know, <laughs> uh, but he said, apparently this is not a joke. He, I see. He said, you got any ideas? I said, well, I mean, Tom, you have our notes and stuff, right? And he goes, no. I threw them all away. When the book was canceled, that's what he does. He packs it all into a box and dumps it in the trash. So I, he says, I got nothing. <laughs> I said, so he goes, okay. He says, I got one idea. And he pitched it real quick. And we did like a, I think it was like a four or six issue arc called Marked for Death. Because it was just... Spider Girl, you know, and it was this nice little crime drama thing that DeFalco writes very well, and we just had to fly like the wind on that one, and because when I heard it was uncanceled, I said, you know, you're bringing Pat back, right? If Pat's, if the book's uncanceled, you know, and he goes, no, Pat's, he was still doing these other jobs, he'd been hard to do, and there was more work down the pipe, and all that stuff, and I said, okay, and I, you know, I called Pat, and I said, did, did you hear about this? And I told him what was going on, and he gave me his blessing, and, you know, that was that. But, uh, and, you know, God, it went how many more years after that? It was nuts. So. It's such a nice story. You know, you hear so much negative stories associated with Internet feedback <laughs> and things, and I just, I remember that one where it was just oh, like these guys fans just rallying the, and doing everything. To this could. day, it's, it's I'm really Facebook cool. friends with a lot of these people. Uh, I started interacting with them on the Spider-Girl message board, and then when I joined Facebook, we, we started to connect that way. And there's a young guy in Australia that uh, was a huge supporter of Spider-Girl and, and the MC2 universe, and 
several other gentlemen that were that I've had the pleasure to meet in person. I've never met the kid from Australia in person, but several other guys that have met over the years. Because uh, a couple of times, like Sal and Tom DeFalco, Sal Sum and Tom DeFalco were able to come into Pittsburgh. And one time we, I had a cake made. And we celebrated Spider Girl, one of Spider Girl's anniversaries, with the fans and all that kind of stuff. And yeah, it's been, it, it was incredibly gratifying because, I mean, everybody says this about their fans, but they're not stupid people. I mean, this isn't a case where you know I like her, I like the way you draw her because we never drew her that way, you know that kind of thing. These were people who were a lot of female readers. But a lot of young readers, and, and we had a wonderful cross-section because the older readers liked the fact that Pete had aged with them. That Pete was now in his mid to late 40s and, you know, uh, married to Mary Jane, a teenage daughter, all this kind of stuff. So the, the, the long time, the Ditko fans liked the fact that, oh, I get to see Pete like me. The young fans liked the second generation thing, and they related to May Day and all this kind of stuff. And and Tom just writes very likable characters. I mean, we don't when we collaborate on characters, whether it's Thor or, or Spider Girl or Thunderstrike, whatever it is, we recognize the fact that if you're going to visit with these people once a month and invite them into your home, and those the most successful TV shows in the world might not be great literature, but there are people, you know, they, they used to always talk about the networks would look for people who you wanted to invite into your home every week, you know. And TV personalities might might not be great actors, but they were TV personalities who yeah. you would invite into your home. And Tom and I write, we try to write decent people. We try to write nice people you would like to hang out with, you know. I mean, Eric Masterson was just a guy. He was equal parts Tom and me and... Our best friends, and you know, he liked cars because DeFalco liked cars, and <laughs> and uh, you know, he had a, he had a uh, a kid. He was divorced with a kid because my brother was divorced with a kid, and we were writing, you know, write what you know, you know, that kind of thing. Let me ask you this: uh, the the bulk of how we've gained an audience with this YouTube channel is by going through Wizard Magazine from you know issue one, okay. and we're continuing right. forward. And we're reinvestigating that speculation boom that took place then. Mm -hmm. Now, if, of course, if, at first we had Spider-Man, we had X-Force, we had X-Men 1, and they did those numbers. You did Thunderstrike number one at a time when there were uh, like some speculators who were buying tons of comics. Oh, yeah. And uh, royalties were in place, man. So that must have been the most lucrative we did, we job did we okay. ever did. We did okay. The most bizarre thing with, with Thunderstrike number one is because you're right. It was in the midst of the boom. And it had a, you know, uh, what was that called? A foil. Yeah. Some kind of a foil cover on the light. And I was the one that insisted we just do it as the lightning. And uh, my pencils, there's like one big lightning bolt coming down. And production went in to put a lot of lightning bolts in it to, <laughs> to make the most of the foil printing. But I, overall, I'm very, very happy with the book and very happy with that cover. But the weirdest thing that happened with that were these guys who were paying you a cup, a buck a book or something like that to sign these things. That's so th great. There's an ad for this in the Wizard magazine where you had to sign ten thousand goddamn comics. What and happens? It, that what day? was crazy though? What was insane about it was I started a bidding war without meaning to because I didn't know what people were getting paid for this. So I put this one guy off a minute because some guy that I knew was offering me, you know, he's, would you do a signing for me? And I said I got to talk to this guy before I can agree to this. And, and he thought I was playing him. You know, he thought I was negotiating. And I, I wasn't. I, I <laughs> So he upped it to, I, I don't know how many books I signed, but... Uh, if you signed them all, you signed 10,000 fucking books. <laughs> I, I think I, I don't know where the bidding started or how much I got paid. I, my memory is that I, I made 10 grand on the signing. Because I remember telling a female friend of mine that and got the impression I became more attractive for a dinner date. Let's put that in perspective for people watching this at home. That's approximately 30 long boxes of comics. Oh, 10,000 comics. It was a long damn day of signing, yeah. But these guys were set up for it and they used to do it all the time. Because you're right, this was like during the death of Superman. and yeah. They were bringing in the entire Superman crew and had workers who were moving books wow. through. And I think Dan Jurgens had to sign 25,000. I, I, I did a signing. Pat did a poster, uh, a Spider-Man print of uh, Spider-Man fighting the Hulk and the uh, Enforcers. 
And it was this weird collector's thing where because it was going to be a collector's thing, I penciled like two of the enforcers and I, and then I think the same guy inked the whole thing and then the colorist. And because they involved me and Pat wasn't able to do it, I drove to New Jersey to their warehouse and did little remarks, little Spider-Man remarks on I don't even know how many of these things and signed them, you know. And Pat came in and did his signing while I was sitting there doing my, my little remarks, wondering what life was like in the outside <laughs> world. But yeah, it was it was crazy. I, that kind of stuff was just nuts. Because I'm sure nobody made... Yeah, the, I still people can get a hold of a Thunderstrike book for not all that much money. They, so they would be anybody that back. paid some kind of premium rate at the time for an autographed Thunderstrike got ripped off. I mean, it, it's a, it's a shame. <laughs> that was it's the era. Shame. There was a lot of ripping off. There yeah. was a lot of uh, investing whole, young children of their money. And there were a lot of people who were saying, "What are you guys doing? This is what happened to trading cards. This is what happened to sports cards. What are you doing?" And Nobody would listen. Nobody would listen to the voice crying in the wilderness. DeFalco was one of the loudest voices about it. Um, you know, he he fought a lot of that the speculator nonsense, and I mean, he never would have sat still for you know fifteen variant covers and all this kind of stuff to try to force uh, uh, retailers to order a certain number or whatever. I mean, that, that's just that's nuts. That's admitting that your material that you you don't have the audience you need. And you're depending on the audience buying multiple copies. That's nuts. What other publishing or entertainment venture does that? That's crazy. Yeah, we've seen a lot of slimy examples yeah, of exactly I mean, but what they, that's like of. asking That's like asking somebody to buy, well, if you buy ten tickets to the next Pirates game, <laughs> one of them might be the golden ticket. And, you know, you know that's crazy. That's crazy. So, yeah, I've never been a big fan of it. I, I mean, it, it, like I said, I, I am very, I feel very fortunate that I got in in, in, in 83 when we still had newsstand sales, still spinner racks, uh, and it did us a lot of good. I mean, Walt outsold us in direct sales, mm -hmm. but we we did, I think we did a little better than Walt on the newsstand. Uh and it, and it makes a certain amount of sense because our stuff was that much more traditional than what Walt was doing graphically, you know. So, do you want to cut ahead to DC? Uh, sh well, how about this? Like you got in in the early '80s, right? And the what Marvel calls the incentive program, like that that comes later. Like you were a part. Were you, did you see a, a change in? Your career, your your uh, with that yeah. Stuff? Oh, I mean, I definitely benefited from every a lot of things that Shooter instituted. What year, would that have been? Eighty six, like trying to compete with you know the Frank Miller DC. It would have thing. been in that area. I'm trying to remember. I, I mean, because I was doing Spider Man, and eighty five. I think I started Thor in like eighty seven, eighty eight. I mean, we we were almost immediately filling out new character agreements whenever we created a new character. Um, and this would give you a piece of uh, And this would promise us a piece of licensing down the road and everything. So they were they were real sticklers from fairly early on uh, on Spider-Man and certainly on Thor and everything. Anytime we came up with a new idea, they wanted us to fill out the paperwork and stuff and you were an idiot if you didn't. Um, and uh, there was some other point I was going to make about it. Oh, I mean at one point... Uh, it would have been later in the 80s, maybe the early 90s, because Tom and I, uh, mostly Tom, quite honestly, uh, created and I helped design the new Warriors. We oh, yes. We created Night Thrasher, when, and we were given credit for creating the new Warriors because he came up with the name and we brought the team together and stuff. So there's there's some dodgy math that goes on there. Sure. It, there's no doubt That's about it. That's why they call and, it an incentive and not and a royalty. Exactly. And there's a lot of people who, you know, will argue to this day about who did what to who and why somebody's getting paid for a certain character and stuff. But because I even said, uh, you know, Th Thorcore, we created Dargo Thor, the future Thor, but... Really, we get Thorcore because we came up with the the goofy name because that's Beta Ray Bill and Eric Masterson and Dargo Thor. So if we're already getting a royalty for Eric Masterson and Dargo Thor, 
why do we good Thorcore? And Tom just went, shut up. Yeah. I, I, was, I was about to tell you that. On, I was about to put my hand on the mic. But it was like, but New Warriors was the same kind of thing. Um, and at one point, the point I was going to make, at one point, we were working on Thor, and Silver Sable had her own book. Yeah. Uh, Night Thrasher had a mini series. New Warriors was doing very well. And was there another one? Wonder Man? <laughs> no, but uh, we were getting checks. Books were selling back then, and we uh, we were getting halfway decent checks for books we weren't even touching. They they were really pushing we were, yeah. New Warriors in like almost every book. I, well, I mean, and Fabian and Mark Bagley were doing fantastic work. It was a yeah. solid title for yeah. years. I mean, and you know, it it ran for for what quite a quite a while. But I mean, it, it, there was just this weird time in my career where I was working on Thor and I was happy as a clam. But I would get checks from Marvel for the sale based on the sales of books I didn't even go near because I was the creator. Now you know that doesn't happen anymore. We need to get these guys in the movies. Nobody's What's a Night Thrasher movie. <laughs> nobody's breaking. Uh, well, and then that's the thing. I mean, we probably made more money from the incentives of the sales at the time than we would for for a movie unless they were above the title. But even then, I mean, it was like Len Wein made you know you, it made the comment at one point that. He made more money off of Lucius Fox as a character from the Batman trilogy than he did off of Wolverine. And that probably has something to do with the different companies and how they parse that stuff. He's, he's not the only one to say this, man. It but seems it's, like a, you know, I, for, for, for a long time I heard you didn't get money if it, unless it was in the title, you know, unless it was called Wolverine, you know, and things like that. So there's all kinds of crazy stuff. We got, we got two generous checks for Ant-Man and Ant-Man and the Wasp because when they were when they came up with the uh the two generation thing where Michael Douglas was going to play Hank Pym and Scott Lang and they decided that they were going to use uh Hank Pym's daughter somebody googled it and <laughs> said does Hank Pym have a daughter in the comics well there's some book that was called A Next and it was set 16 years in the future and he had a daughter there her name was Hope you know, forget that she was a bad guy and right. all that kind of stuff, but they used the name Hope. The Falco and I got a thank you credit and, uh, and, a, and a check that was very generous. I jokingly call it the please don't sue us check. You yeah, know no, doubt. I mean? no doubt. Because, they, you know, I, I appreciate it. I really do. Certainly they're not obligated, but I know they also are just trying to avoid any complications down the road and God love them for it. You know, I mean, it's... I, I remember when one of the gentlemen who was a higher up who called me about the check, that I was going to get the check and thank you and all this stuff, and I characterized it the way I just did with you, that somebody checked Google and signed on. So I wasn't like overly flattered or, you know, well, I'm really glad you guys are doing your due diligence or anything like that. I was kind of saying, you know, that's kind of funny that somebody bothered. Um, he he kind of took offense that uh, I was treating it so lightly, you know, that kind of thing. And it's like, come on, dude. <laughs> I mean, we got a thank you credit, no money. We got a thank you credit on Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. because they were grabbing S.H.I.E.L.D. agents from everywhere and they were using the comics as uh, source material. And they had an Agent 33. They only once called her Kara. And we did a Hercules miniseries where we had a character named uh, Kara, uh, I think it was Kara, Palomas or something based on a Star Trek character and she was Agent 33 because I tried to look up uh, who mourns for Adonais and what you know what episode number that was for Star Trek and everything and 33 we, we got a thank you credit for the number 33 basically because <laughs> our character was a blonde their character was a brunette uh, you know it, it, sometimes it's just it, it's silliness and people go congratulations that's great that you're finally getting recognized for for the number 33 and the word hope. <laughs> so, <laughs> so that kind of thing. Yeah, you know. It's, Let's talk craft. Let's you, talk craft. I think of your work as a Macaroni very, and cheese. <laughs> very high level of craft. It's something that I've heard you talk about. Yes. Um, I wonder how that develops. You know, like you're working on animation whenever you break into comics. Mm -hmm. You're working remotely. So I don't know how much interaction you have with other artists, with uh, editors, how how are you developing craft as a that's a, that's fascinating. I a lot of it, un, unfortunately or fortunately, can be self taught. I mean, it's it's what you're able to glean from observing and trying to look behind the curtain and things like that. You know, I would all 
read the fan magazines and always loved seeing penciled, you know, Xeroxes of pencils and things like that. Um, but, and I'll be honest, when I, when I first started on Kesar as my first regular gig, I wasn't getting a lot of feedback from uh, a wonderful editor, Louise Jones, who is now Louise Simonson. She was fantastic and, and very supportive and, and very creative. But I, I had to solicit, <laughs> you know, am I doing okay? I mean, I kind of got thrown in on the deep end and the book has to come out monthly. And, you know, she goes, you're doing fine, Ron. What do you mean? And, and I would, you know, okay. So I'm doing okay. And she goes, yeah, you don't. It was, it was nuts. So that all changed with DeFalco. When DeFalco became my editor on Team Up, one of the first things he said to me when he hired me was, well, you're going to find I'm a bit of a bastard. And I said, what do you mean by that, Tom? And he said, well, you know, I'm going to be in touch with you about how you're doing things, and I'm going to let you know what I think. And I said, hallelujah, Tom. And I said, it's great. As much as I love Louise, I didn't get a lot of that. That's great. You know, I, because for me, I, I never had... I mean, one, you go into this business, you know it's highly collaborative. I didn't train myself with the inking tools. I, I, I knew this was going to be a situation where I was going to be paired with work with other illustrators. I was counting on it because, you know, early on getting paired with Tom Palmer is like hallelujah. You know, I mean, you know, it just, it becomes a learning experience. Everything becomes a learning experience. This is the, the, the years I spent on Thor with Joe Sinnott, every issue was like a textbook on it on the craft. But Tom DeFalco is is a craft guy and he reinforced that attitude in me that there was a an objectively correct way to accomplish what we were trying to accomplish. And you know the examples I use at times, I don't know how good they are, is is that a belt can be a beautiful piece of leather craft. It can be a piece of art. But if it doesn't have the little holes in it that hold your pants up, it's not a belt. It doesn't function. You know, a, a chest of drawers can be a beautiful piece of woodwork and it can be art, but if it doesn't hold your socks, <laughs> then it's not a chest of drawers. And a comic can be a beautiful piece of artwork, but if it doesn't clearly communicate a story and, in my opinion, also evoke some kind of an emotional reaction, engage and invoke a, an emotional reaction, then it, it didn't serve its function. Everything has a function. You know, Comic books have a function to tell a story. And I miss the days when the craft ruled the... I mean, granted, it was driven by the commerciality of it at the time, and you know, the decision whether or not you were going to do six-issue stories or two-issue stories or try to do one-and-done whatever, were often decisions that were made at the, you know, more, a uh, more editorial level or a more corporate level or whatever, and as far as what was selling. But I, I've always appreciated the idea that, you know, Tom and I together as a, as a unit came to consider ourselves, um, basically what our job, is, we're idea machines. You know, if, if you're coming to, you want us to produce a story for you, Give us parameters, we'll fill those parameters. Give us a page count, we'll do the page count. You know, that kind of thing. Um, so in that regard, I see it as as technical. and it, But it's only to a certain level, because quite frankly, I don't enjoy working full script. The times I've worked full script, I felt like I was trying to do a, a you know, a, a, a geometry problem or a, a physics problem, because you're... Tr you're, it, it requires you to to try to see more through the writer's eyes, and the writer will describe this panel <laughs> where it's like this guy needs three arms to do this in one panel. What did, and it used to make me crazy. The few times I worked that way it made me crazy. So I became very comfortable with uh, with working Marvel style, working plot script with the Falco, um, and uh, you know it just you become the visual, you know, he's, he's the conceptual and, and you become the visual and you work together. And, and I see it very much as, you know, you're the director, you're the costumer, you're the set designer, you know, and all that kind of stuff. But it, but it's all part and parcel and it all must serve the storytelling. And if it doesn't, what are you doing, man? You know, that kind of thing. I mean, I, I see some of these illustrators that are doing like incredibly beautiful work. And they proudly display double-page splashes on Facebook. 
I couldn't tell you what was going on if you put a gun to my cat's head. I, I just, you can't read it. There seems to be a lot of competition amongst, like, the divisions of labor. So, like, the writer tries to almost outright the art. The artist has to, like, get his. Because at this point now, there is no Marvel method style right. of yeah, mainstream comic book stories. So, so it really is just an illustration job. And these people want to, like... They want to shine, you know, and then they will over render. And, and they well, like and they've become the very they've, they've come become very dependent on their colorists yeah. to sort it all out, and you know, and all. Let that me kind ask of. you this: uh, through the eighties, you did have Jim Shooter as editor in chief, and he very famously trumpets that he almost like give gave like uh, clinics about storytelling in comics. You know, mid shot, six panel grids, blah blah blah. Right? Did he ever drop some of that science on you? Um. I don't remember a specific time where he felt it necessary to drop it on me. I did get the sense that he was happy with the work I was doing. Um, before we were hired on Thor, Sal was going to stay after Walt left, and DeFalco was hired as the writer. Mm -hmm. We did two fill-ins. Uh, we uh, the, uh, the future Thor, but we did one fill-in that was... That it was a flashback to the Secret Wars, the original Secret Wars, with the Enchantress and a bunch of the bad guys fighting Thor. And Shooter really liked what I did on it, which was very flattering. He's my boss, that's great. And he was the one that was pushing for them to hire me on Thor. And it's like, we don't need an artist on Thor. Sal's staying on Thor. And and he must have said to DeFalco at one point, I just heard this secondhand, he said to DeFalco at one point, we'll, we'll just tell Sal that you're bringing your own artist along. <laughs> Tom goes, except that's not true. <laughs> I mean, that kind of thing. And then right around then, from what I understand, Jim Salakrup walked in and said, can I hire Sal to do a spider Spectacular Spider-Man again? Because we'd really need somebody solid on Spectacular Spider-Man and we need to get the book up and running and solid and all that kind of stuff. And everybody just went, hallelujah. <laughs> and Sal was happy to go over, back over to Spider-Man and I was hired to do Thor. And uh, from what I understand, it was something that Shooter was connected to because he had scripted the original Secret Wars yeah. that the scene was based on, and he liked the fact that in virtually the same amount of page count, I was able to get a little more uh, Marvel action in it and all this kind of stuff. Not to say that I was any better than Mike Zek, because I'm not, but Zek was dealing with completely different demands uh, in the course of that uh, of that issue. and uh, but, but Shooter was... Uh, personally connected to that book enough that he was appreciating what I had done with it. So I, I always kind of got the impression that he was fairly happy with my stuff. The one thing I know I was doing for a while that he hated was uh, I picked it up from Sal. Sal was putting little, when he would ink black backgrounds, he would put little halos around the character, little mm, graphic yeah. halos. And I do it on my commissions to this day. But I found out he hated that. Terribly, and when we were, I was doing it in my first issue of Kickers Inc. And Sal inked my first issue of Kickers. The first time I ever got to work with Sal. So he was keeping them ink, and Shooter had somebody going with a sharpie and filling <laughs> all those halos around the character because that just did not read. That read too graphic to him. You know that that violated his willing suspension of disbelief as far as the environment of the characters and stuff. I I'm speaking for him. I don't know if that's <laughs> the fact. Fact. Other maybe he just hated it. He dated a woman that had a halo around her head. And she couldn't stand <laughs> there is it. just all this subjective taste. It well, stuff well that, I mean, that that factors that in. we are in a subjective business. That's yeah. absolutely true. Yeah. And I, that's what I tell people when they want my opinions <laughs> on portfolios and stuff. It's like, dude, I could, I could tear you a new one and tell you I don't think you have a shit chance in hell and you could walk down the hall and you can get hired by the next editor you talk to. Yeah. I said, my opinion is like anybody else's. You know, opinions are like <laughs> are like assholes. You know, everybody's got one and they all stink to one degree or another. <laughs> so it, it is what it is. I mean, but it is hugely subjective. It always has been. You know, and people fetishize things. Like I still remember, like one of my uh, my life drawing teacher at art school. He really gave a shit about the way you drew earlobes and the little interior <laughs> piece of the ear, like. People have their right. fetishes, man. Oh, absolutely. I yeah. wonder, Jim, should we take things to uh, DC Comics? Yeah, let's do that. Let's let's go on. So that's mid '90s. The bubble, the speculator bubble, the of those bubble burst. Early '90s is gone. 
What's that look like? I mean, you're, you're going to shift companies at this point. It was, uh, it was very scary is what it was because <laughs> when DeFalco went from executive editor to editor-in-chief, under Shooter, I was offered, I think I was offered the contract under Shooter because I was, I was Mr. Regular. I mean, if I, you put me on a book, I wasn't going anywhere. So uh, on Thor, during the time I was on Thor, I was offered a contract with Marvel. It was terrific. I never took a vacation or anything. I mean, but it was great. You know, you were you were basically salaried based on a page count and blah blah blah. And it was it was great. You know, you had to, you know it was it was terrific. What happened was that carried over into Thunderstrike, which Thunderstrike was caught up in the Perlman sale when Ron Perlman bought bought Marvel, and things started to get rocky, and Thunderstrike was selling incredibly well. A lot of those books were selling incredibly well. One of Ron Perlman's people said at a meeting, and Tom DeFalco was present at this meeting as editor-in-chief at the time, that their idea was, if you cancel half the line, the half that's left sells twice as well. <laughs> and DeFalco reacted exactly the way you did, and then he went, oh my God, you're serious. He said, this isn't... Cookies. Cans of beans. Yeah. This isn't, you know, this is not, if, if a, you know, if you cancel a kid's favorite book, he's not going to just buy another book. He's going to get a soda and a slice of pizza, you know, that kind of thing. It's like, you're playing a very dangerous game here where you're, you know, you're, you're talking about this as if it's like stamped out product and it's, and it's not. Um, and he knew when he laughed that he was marked. I mean, he, he ended up not lasting much longer. He was asked to, to vacate his position. So, w Thunderstrike was one of the books that was canceled. You know, the books that were considered uh, reflections of other you know, spin-off characters, basically. War Machine, uh, I don't know what other ones, Force Works, a bunch of other books that were spin-offs of other titles, were canceled in favor of the parent, the parent title. And, and then, of course, a couple of years later, they canceled Thor for the Heroes Reborn stuff, and boy, that pissed me off. But anyway, <laughs> anyway... Um, so that's where it was. Thunderstrike was canceled. I had a contract that was of no use to anyone unless they could find me work at Marvel. Mark Grunewald, God love this gentleman. I don't know if you ever had the pleasure to meet him, but he's an incredible guy. He was, and he, I'm sorry, as much as I love Tom DeFalco, Mark Grunewald was the heart and soul of that company. I'm actually choking up a little bit. Uh, he was a, the... Best combination of fan and professional I've ever met in my life. And I only had a chance to really spend time in a room with him very few times. But what a great guy. I know for a fact that he was busting his ass looking for work for me. Because he knew I had been loyal to the company for decades. And and it just wasn't there. And I, I read later in an interview his, uh, his wife, uh, after he had passed, was reading his diary. And she just saw his journal in his journal how the last months at Marvel they just broke him you know he, he, he passages would start with I had to fire so and so today you know it, it, people who were close friends and one of those cases for Mark was that he had to call me and say the work's not there I'm sorry Ron you know I we really tried it's just not there and, you know, I tried to make him feel as okay about it as I could because my, Mike Carlin called. Mike Carlin had worked at Marvel. He was a, a Grunewald guy, really. I mean, he had been Grunewald's assistant for years. And he had been having great success as the editor, the on-hands editor of the Superman titles. And he was now more of an executive editor or something. And he was religiously opposed to poaching talent. So he would never approach talent that was engaged in a project, but he had heard through Brett Breeding that Thunderstrike was going away, and I had been keeping, Brett and I were, have been close friends for years, I had been keeping him posted on the status with Thunderstrike in my contract, so, you know, I was able to tell Mark, Mark, okay, this one you don't need to worry about, I wanted to take every opportunity to try to stay at Marvel, but I got somewhere to land, so don't worry. And I called Mike Carlin, and I said, I'm in. If you'll have me, I'm in, you know. So that's how I ended up over there. 
And it just, things got worse. I mean, just things got worse at Marvel. I mean, it was awful. I heard that there were a couple of bloody Thursdays where, you know, people, secretaries were fired, production people were fired, angry husbands were coming in and taking swings at editors because, you know, their wives were just let go like that without any notice. I mean, it was just, it was, it was, it was a nightmare. It was a goddamn nightmare. And you just hated to see it. And I don't think the company has ever been the same. I mean, some people would argue it's been better. It's certainly been leaner. But, I, I mean, it was... I, I was very, again, as I said before, I was very lucky to get in when I did because there was still this sense of the bullpen. I mean, you know, Stan wasn't there. Roy wasn't there. But there was this generation of guys, you know, even Shooter, to a large degree, whatever you think of him and some of his business decisions and his ability to play well with others. I mean, he brought a lot of good things to the to the industry, you know, like incentives and things like that. And uh, certainly he worked to bring page rates up and, and all that kind of stuff. And I, I, you know, I owe him a lot working under his Marvel. But, you know, with guys like DeFalco and Grunewald and uh, Tom Brevoort and Ralph Macchio and, and guys that had been in the business and, and, you know, at that point you're talking about an industry that is almost all fans turned pro. But the the difference is the level of pro they become, you know. And these guys were all, you know, smart and on business. They were on point. They knew what their jobs were and they did them well. And you would go to a convention and be proud to be one of the Marvel guys. And, and Grunewald would do these crazy things where he would do like the Marvel Olympics where... You'd have a big panel, it would start as like a panel discussion, but it was basically, you'd pull people out of the audience and they would compete in stupid little games with the Marvel pros and and uh, we'd make goofs of ourselves and interact with the fans and, I mean, it was just wonderful. It just made you, it, it made you feel like a part of something to wear a Marvel jacket with a logo on it, you know, and all that kind of stuff. And I, I the fact that I got to experience that at all is just fantastic to me, I I, I got to do conventions with the black costume where there was this one gentleman named uh, Scott Leva. It was a stuntman actor. And he the black costume was tailored specifically for him. And he, he was built like a gymnast. The guy was incredible. He could have played Peter Parker in a movie and almost did, actually. But he, if a kid challenged him for spider powers, he, he had the line about you can't use the webbing because it takes an hour for it to dissolve and the hotel <laughs> won't let me use, you know make a mess. So I didn't even bring my web shooters. So well, then how do you prove you're Spider-Man? And he would take the kid and he goes, okay, I want you to stand right here. And he would run at the kid and jump over the kid and do a perfect roll and come up in a Spider-Man position, you know, and the kid's like, you know, because he would have the kid <laughs> facing away from him. That's and awesome. he, he would, the kid would see him come over and do the roll and come up as Spider-Man. Well, that was stunning. And then one time some kid was being particularly a doubting Thomas and he, Scott runs at the wall, and I, I watched it myself. I swear to God, this is true. He runs at the wall and takes like two or three steps up the wall and does a backflip, like you see people do, these, uh, you know, kung fu stuntmen and stuff, and lands in a Spider-Man position, and I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> I mean, the kid was just, it was, it was wonderful to watch, and he was a lot of fun to work with, and, uh, you know, I mean, even when we introduced the costume, I was doing a panel discussion, and we had a, 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 a patio doors behind us, sliding glass doors behind us, and he climbed up onto the gutters or something, you know, and dropped down behind me as I'm talking in the red and blue, and then came in and, you know, I greeted him as Spider-Man, and the audience is applauding and all this kind of stuff, and then we make the announcement, and he, I surreptitiously pull the zipper on the back of the red and blue costume and he peels off the red and blue costume and has a black costume on under it. I can't even imagine whether <laughs> he couldn't see. I mean, between the two <laughs> between the two uh, eyes, I, I don't know how he could see. But I mean, there were just moments like that that were just it's what you dream about when you're a kid working for Marvel Comics, that you feel like you're a part of the bullpen, you're a part of Marvel Comics. And it was it was just incredible. It's wonderful. Um about uh, how about your time at DC? Like, and at DC, well, 
I mean, because for as much as I remember all those wonderful ex- examples of the, the family feeling at conventions, I never, I never really got to the offices all that much mm-hmm. at Marvel. I would go in for Christmas parties and occasional meetings and stuff. With DC, I, I was invited to, you know, my first Superman summit. <coughs> it was, you know, it could be very creative, but I, I got to be honest, I came in at a very... Mike Carlin was no longer the hands-on editor. It was handled to two different people. In the two years I was on Superman, there were two different editors that were tasked with trying to ride the same herd that Mike Carlin did. And, and neither one of them were very successful at it. But one of the problems was, is we, you, you know, once you do the death of Superman and you have those kinds of sales and you have different people's creative opinions of who was responsible for those sales and who motivated those sales... You know, the, the people, that the veterans who had been on the books for a while, who had done incredible work for years, there was a lot of resentment and infighting amongst them, and uh, it was it was very difficult. I, my, my first creative meeting, uh, the Superman Summit, was not a positive experience. I mean, it was no one person's fault, but it was, you know, it was an unsatisfying exchange of creative ideas you know i mean it, it was and uh you know it ended up being very tiring because the superman books were basically weekly i mean there yeah. were four monthly titles that came out basically weekly and when you got your script or your plot and they were still working plot script at the time when you got your plot you had to start production immediately. There was no reading it and sitting with it for a couple of days or something because the next guy, you know, if you were establishing a character or a location or something that continued in the next issue, the next guy had to see your layouts. They wanted them in the next package. They sent out weekly packages to everybody on all four teams, and you needed to get your layouts in so the next guy could see what was going on and blah, blah, blah. And it was murder, man. I... I was not up to it, I'll tell you. I mean, I, I did my share of monthly work. I We even did summers bi-weekly with Thor several times. Yeah. We would uh, do Tales of Asgard or, you know, some backup. But we were doing 17 pages every two weeks. <coughs> and, then, you know, I always managed to do that. But I got to say, the Superman stuff was a real challenge. The guys who really put in the years on those books... The, uh, the 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 Brett Breedings and the John Bogdanovs and and uh, the Jerry Ordways and and the Dan Jurgenses, I mean they're troopers, man. I'll tell you because that was a tough gig. That was a tough gig, and I only I only left to do Strange Visitor. They decided they were going to take the Electric Blue costume and try to do something with it as a spinoff character because you know Venom was a big hit. So they asked me to do it and went through a lot of different permutations. And I was working with an editor named Joey Cavalieri, and there was this whole creative panel that you had to answer to that were like many, many cooks giving you dozens of different ideas about how they thought this thing should be developed and trying to distill that down to a creative direction was almost impossible. And it was supposed to be an ongoing series, but... What it ended up, what they ended up offering us was uh, one issue of each of the Superman titles. So it would run over the course of a month. It would be a four-issue run over the course of a month to introduce the character. And then we'll see where we go from there. And uh, it, early on it was snake bit because I tried to bring DeFalco over for it. And there were some of the people at DC had issues with Tom having been so highly placed at Marvel. And when... He asked about page rates. You know, somebody at DC decided that the only reason he was asking DC for a page rate is because he was trying to renegotiate his page rate with Marvel, and they decided that he was trying to snake him and all this stuff that wasn't true. But Tom ended up not coming over to do the project with me, and I ended up bringing my brother, who had done some writing for Marvel, over to help me dialogue it and everything. But, you know, it became one of these things where it almost went away a couple of times. And I, you know, and I said, wait a minute, this thing existed before DeFalco was a part of it. Why is it going away if DeFalco doesn't come over? So I fought for it. And, you know, the editor goes, well, you know, the creative council was just really, I said, 
Joey, you're the editor on this project. Help me just... I'm going to list all the different things that are a part of this story so far. You tell me what you like and what you don't like. And, you know, I, uh, how about this, this supporting character? I don't really think that's out. How about, you know, and I, and I boiled it all down for the four issues, so we had a structure. And we did it, but I, nobody even looked at it. You know, I said, so what was the opinion? Did they look at it? Because Sal inked it, Glenn Whitmore colored it. But overall, it was a, you know it was a decent four issues, and I said you know this all started with me leaving the Superman title to do a new ongoing of Strange Visitor. Where are we at? And they said I don't think anybody's really all that interested in revisiting it, Ron, and all. it just went away. And I'm going okay, so I'm back on Superman. No, because a whole bunch of new teams had been hired in the meantime to do Superman, and I'm like okay, and again very fortunately. Uh, during the course of my run on Superman, we had done the Spider-Girl one-shot, and Marvel was interested in doing the MC2 line, so I was able to bounce back over to Marvel and work with the Falco and had somewhere to land, you know, that kind of thing. So, you know, I've been fortunate that way. I've always apparently found somewhere to land. <laughs> that, I mean, my longest period was after Spider-Girl was canceled, where I was heavily relying on commission private commission work and things like that but uh but yeah and I, I was doing you know subcontracting work with a couple of different guys doing a little bit of toy design and stickers for toys and all kinds of crazy stuff and uh and you know, putting together catch as catch can work before the next comics opportunity came up so but yeah dc it was a different it was definitely a different vibe but i don't think that speaks to DC as a whole because the the Superman books had become because of what Carlin and that crew had accomplished with the death of Superman and everything the the, the Superman books were <laughs> I I guess the best way it was a it was rarefied air in both positive and negative ways sure you know so it was uh it was I don't think it was representative of of DC overall and and I've done some, you know, some other stints with DC. I mean, most recently, I guess, I, I did some layouts for them because some of their young talent was having trouble with the blank page, keeping them on any kind of a schedule if they had to deal with the blank page. So they were bringing in veteran guys like me and Scott McDaniel and a couple other people. I think even Larry Hama did a few. I don't know. We're doing, you know, layouts for... Uh, for them so they didn't have to deal with the blank. That's probably also one of these things of like <coughs> teaching these kids how to do the storytelling stuff because yeah. they are coming out of illustration programs and art schools. They're working with these full scripts. Yeah, and, yeah, uh, I mean, I could see that. I mean, the, the, the comic book sensibility has shifted. There's no, there's no denying that, and that's, that's fine. Um, but, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a natural progression, but it, it is a shame that, that, that what used to be, I mean, even you know, when I even look back at, at Eisner's work and the life and the the, car, the the cartooning that can happen, but you you can do a type of uh, stylized cartooning, but then you can put you know cross lighting on it and yeah. everything, and it just becomes this wonderful graphic combination of elements that that are so unique to comics that you know I. I think paintings are wonderful, but I don't really want to... I think a comic book of paintings looks very static. It looks like it's trying to be something else. And comics, in my observation, comics have spent many times in, in, its, in, in their history trying to be or, or resisting the classification of the red-headed stepchild. They don't want to be... TV junior, they don't want to be movies junior, you know, but they don't know how to be what they are and just embrace what they do the best, you know. So, I, you know, that's something collectively that we've just got to deal with. And now I think a lot of these guys think, well, we're just R&D for, for big budget movies. And, you know, a lot of these guys are <laughs> could very easily be hired to do pre paintings and stuff for the movies because... That's, it seems to be that's what they're doing in the comics right now, you know, and, and God love them, I guess. See, stupidly, when I went and saw the first Fantastic Four movie where they successfully did a CGI human torch, 
You didn't quite agree with the Roger Corman CGI human torch? <laughs> no, no, because that was like when CGI was in people's garages and stuff. Yeah, I mean, but when they did that 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 first Fantastic Four movie, I, my response creatively was completely wrong because I thought that now that we've seen this live, you know, now that we've seen a CGI representation of what a human being on fire looks like. Alex Ross is out of a job. We we don't need. I, I love Alex Ross's stuff, but but I basically I'm thinking we don't need Alex Ross anymore. We don't need Brian Hitch anymore. We don't need guys that are taking it more and more photographic because now they can do it on the movie screen. They can be photographic. So we're tomorrow morning. We're all going to get up and start drawing the Human Torch like Jack Kirby again. You know that kind of thing. That's how stupid I was. You know, and then now we can get back to what we do best, which is that graphic, dynamic graphic representation of life. That didn't happen, of course. I was completely wrong. <laughs> and now they've taken all the cool costumes and form-fitting costumes and the costumes that show the dynamic form in motion and turned them into the movie suits that have too many lines on them and scenes. Yeah, looking like G.I. Uh, Joes or and something. And laces. And all. Yeah, it's like crazy. So, I mean, I, I was completely wrong about that and many, many things in my 35, 36-year <laughs> career. Hit that. All right, Ron, you want to do, uh, we'll, we'll throw some names at you and you okay. can kind of react sure. however. I will do what I can. Uh, Frank Miller. Frank Miller. Uh, very talented. Um, Tom DeFalco gave him a bunch of crime novels and fostered his targeting that venue for Daredevil. So, you know, I, I, in some ways, I guess, you know, if Tom wanted to be a weirdo about it, he could take credit for Sin City and all this kind of stuff, you know, because Tom was very much into that. And he, he told me at one point that, you know, it, when it, I think Miller was already interested in taking it that direction, but that Tom gave him a bunch of, uh, you know, Mickey's, uh, Mickey's hard bitten, you know, street level stuff to read and everything. Um, but no, I mean, I, I in, always enjoyed his early superhero stuff. I, again, I... I, I, what I enjoy about comics is the, I, I need my graphic representation to be, uh, uh, organic enough that the creators disappear and you're engaging with the characters just like you do in a movie, you know, just like you forget it's Chris Evans and it's Steve Rogers, you know, that's how I've always enjoyed comics. So when, when he got to his Ronin phase and everything, I, he started to lose me. Um, and you know, this last, what was it, the third dark Knight thing he did where there were these big discussions going on on social media about, you know, what the hell is that? And people were defending it and all that kind of stuff. And it's like, it is what it is. I mean, you, you if you put work like that out there, people are going to feel the way they feel about it. And I'm, I'm glad there were people out there to defend it, but it, you know, he, he moved in a direction that, you know, it, it stopped being all that entertaining for me. I enjoyed the first Sin City movie, but the Sin City books are so graphic and so out there graphically that, again, I have trouble relating to them as organic characters and, and, and uh, enjoying them for that reason. So, I mean, my, you know, my tastes are sure. admittedly limited. Go ahead. Bill Sienkiewicz. Uh, I would probably, first thing that occurred to me was genius. I think the guy's just amazing. Again, I was not a huge fan of the Electra Assassin stuff and everything, but there is no denying the talent that is in that man's little finger. I was lucky enough to work with him a couple times. He inked the, the first Spider-Girl story, and, and he inked the subsequent What If story I did, which was a Thor story with Thunderstrike in it, and there are two completely different experiences. It was amazing because the Spider Girl was a lot of brush. It was very kinetic. You know, you could actually look at it and go, well, why did I bother to pencil that? Because it almost looked like an afterthought or something. It was very uh, kinetic is the best word I can think of. But then the Thor job was a lot of pen. And he was doing this, these amazing pen strokes and then going in with white paint and, and letting the pen skip. And he was doing this finer detail stuff that was just stunning. And I'm like, wow, I wish he would have done that on the Spider-Girl job. <laughs> but I don't, I, I'm the last person in the world to tell Bill Sienkiewicz how he should 
respond <laughs> right. to something. I, I ran something of his and it tagged him. And, you know, he came on, he came on my Facebook page and he goes, that was always a lot of fun, Ron. I really enjoyed those jobs. And I'm like, that's Bill Sienkiewicz. <laughs> I mean, you know, we were talking earlier about how he's doing these, these, these portraits and, and I mean, the guy has more talent in his little finger than any convention room you can fill with talent. It's insane. Uh, the guy's amazing. The guy's amazing. I sat next to him at a, at the early San Diego show before it was the big thing it is now. And for some reason, and Bill can, when you interview Bill, uh, you can ask him about, we were all young guys, but he came back to the table in a blue Speedo bathing suit with a towel around his shoulders because he had just, he had just been at the pool. And it's like, and you didn't think a stop back at the room would be appropriate? And he sat down and started drawing in a blue Speedo with a towel around him soaking wet. He's just showing off, man. <laughs> yeah, he did have a build on him, yeah. Uh, Stuck with me. Watchmen. Watchmen. I loved it. I, the original book was stunning. I was with everybody else. I was sitting there reading this thing going, holy crap. I mean, it was Eisner to me. It was amazing. Amazing stuff. I, I don't like... Uh, this kind of plays back to the Frank Miller thing. I don't like the fact that the industry has tried to suck it dry ever since. Yeah, sure. I mean, the same with Dark Knight, the same with, I mean, the fact that the Dark Knight became the the aesthetic for the Batman books as a whole, the, you know, the fact that they're trying to bleed Watchmen in all kinds of different ways. Did you see the trailer for this HBO thing? Not yet. It has, it, it might be set in the Watchmen world, but <laughs> it has nothing to do with, with the Watchmen. If you study the industry of comics, uh, you always see that if something hits a critical mass, they will squeeze every well, ounce that's, of that's, juice out of it. And that's pop pop culture of any kind, really. I mean, yeah. movies will do it, and uh, I mean, in the eighties, the you know, buddy cop movies and the TV shows. If something's popular, you're trying to do twenty rip offs and stuff. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. So whatever you want. I mean, I don't want to say genius a lot, but Watchmen was obviously you know, it showed us. It showed us what, uh, as I was talking about earlier, what specifically the comics medium can do better than than any than any other medium. I mean, you couldn't do, nobody's been able to do it yet, successfully, you know, with the same, uh, e e bringing the same response from the viewer and all this kind of stuff. You, you just can't do that. I mean, uh, I actually liked the, the Zack Snyder movie, and I liked some of the, I liked the creative choice he made to tie the final solution into Dr. Manhattan rather than coming up with the, you know, big alien thing. Yeah, the big alien thing. But I mean, it just you, you can't you can't react to a movie running in front of you the same way you can interact with a comic page and uh, it was it was amazing stuff. It really was. I have a couple of these. If you don't have anything to say, that's okay. fine. Black and white explosion from the seventies or from the Indies? Indies, like Turtles. Post oh, the Indies. I I will be very honest with you. I never. I didn't recognize the Ninja Turtles as a phenomenon until the movie. Um, I was aware of the toys and all that, but when the movie came out, I went back and bought the first several graphic novels and really enjoyed them. In all of their, you know, uh, the crude ramshackle crudity. You know, I mean, I really did. I and 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 I also was was gratified for Eastman and Laird as to how much of it made it into the movie. I mean, there are frames in that movie that are right out of the early stories, and and uh, so I, I thought it was great. I was also very aware and found it. I was always bemused by the fact that more people knew who the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles were and who Splinter was than would ever know that Splinter was only named Splinter because of Stick and that uh, the right. Foot <laughs> Clan is named after the Hand and, you know, and all that kind of stuff, you know. So I, I, I said, so, so if they do a Daredevil movie based on the Miller stuff right now, everybody think they'll be ripping off Teenage Mutant Ninja <laughs> Turtles, you know. Of course, that's happening now, too, because if they do... 
if they do a Submariner movie now, everybody's going to think they're ripping off Aquaman, and, uh, you know, that, that's the way it happens. It depends on who makes it out into mass pop culture first. So. Steve Ditko. Genius. Simple craft out the wazoo, but the guy, I... I'm fascinated by him. I I only I met him very briefly, and we had no real conversation. It it was you know it was very it was very quick and very ridiculous and innocuous. But but reading about him and reading about his his personal views and how they infused his work and and how he represented them in his work and how he, how dedicated he became to them and and. I have to admit, a, a fascination and a curiosity with the fact that he was never interested in revisiting Spider-Man, that he was never... Obviously, he defended his creative input, you know, when he'd be challenged with the Kirby stuff and all that kind of jazz. And yet, when the movie was made, he had no interest in doing interviews. They tried, you know, God knows they tried. Uh, I'm fascinated by by him as a as a as a person, and uh, I wish I had. You know, I do watch the documentaries on him, and I ch- the one where the guys what is it, from England, mm-hmm. you, you know, Ross, yeah, talk all right those. Uh, talk, they talk for a couple hours, and then they go into the office and come out, and we're not going to tell you because you know they have white streaks in their beards, and they're not going to say anything <laughs> that happened. And it's like, are you kidding me? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think that is a is an example of kayfabe. Uh, to, to be honest, I think there's a little kayfabe that was, in that. You know, that was ludicrous. And I and I've read things. I've read other essays from people who had a chance to meet him and had terrific conversations with him. But then they also sh- like they tried to take a picture and he didn't like it, or they asked him they they you know decided to take a shot and ask him about Spider Man and and you have to. I mean, you can agree or disagree with it, but you have to respect his his integrity as a human being, who he decided he was going to be. He has a set of and ethics and he stuck philosophy. by him to the letter. The guy, they, I mean, that's amazing to me. That that really is. In this in this day and age, that alone is worthy of respect and admiration. But I mean, his body of work is is just incredible, and I I got a great respect for him because. When I was awarded the series, I I went back. You know, no no surprise to anybody that was that, that saw the stuff. But I went back and studied Ditko, and what I learned was that he respected and and uh, was a perfect example of the basics of clear storytelling. Yeah, I mean, he didn't. His job wasn't to challenge the reader to figure out what was going on. His challenge was to clearly tell you what was happening. And, you know, I, I've always been more of a fan of the guys who used the frame, whether it's a, a nine-panel grid or a four-panel grid or a six-panel grid, that they use the frame as the screen. You know, that they, they we're not getting too crazy with how things are overlapping and and making it difficult for the writer to place dialogue and everything. Because, you know, as I've said before, I mean, that that breaks into the illusion that you're watching somebody's life, you know. And, and, it, and it becomes uh, a display piece for the creative people when I've always honestly felt that the creative people should disappear. I mean, I, I love talking to people who said, you know, I, I just realized you're a huge part of my collection. I never really... Under- Tell me, man, a couple boxes right here. But, the, but what they say boxes. is, I never recognized the the credits. But, you know, I'm realizing now that a lot of these, my favorite moments from different things, like, you know, Steve Rogers lifting the hammer, and all, were in books you did, you know, and I'm going, oh, I'm really glad that you were appreciating the stories and the characters and not us, you know. I mean, uh, and, and Tom was a great... You know, he reinforced that in me. That was already my attitude, but but we supported each other in that. That that we did our job if all of the mail was about the characters. That is so interesting. I, I often use that or uh talking about lettering that it often comes up like mm-hmm. people don't notice a great letter or they notice if something's wrong. If, if a word balloons in the wrong place, if something's illegible, whatever, but if it's done well, it's kind of invisible and yeah. I never think about it to the artist we you know, are the puppeteers I, it, i've always i mean we are the puppeteers we are behind the curtain we are creating this bit of alchemy and you know 
I don't want anybody, when you get to a scene where Eric Masterson is devastated because his, his son is being taken away from him and Hercules reaches out to comfort him and they hug, you know, I don't want anybody worrying about how Ron Friends draws shoulders. <laughs> you know, I, this is, you, I want you to feel for Eric and, and for Hercules, you know, that kind of thing. And that's always been the, the, the real challenge for the craft for me is to, is to successfully pull that off is, you know, if you're going to cartoon, don't cartoon so much that the character doesn't look organic anymore, you know, and I've varying degrees of success with the page count I've done. I've had varying degrees of success with sticking to that. I mean, I do model sheets for all the characters that I'm doing. I did a model sheet for Spider Girl, but deadlines can be a real bear, and not every shot of Spider Girl is going to, you know, match that my, my perfect figure in my head. And that's true of you know successfully getting those expressions right and making it work and stuff. I mean, nothing's more confounding to me than uh, comics where you it was done full script. The artist did his best, took his best shot at communicating an expression or a reaction or something, and the writer just let it ride. And I, as the reader, have no idea what those three panels were supposed to mean. Yeah, sure, I know exactly what you're saying. It's it, it's frustrating as hell. Here's a question: You early '80s, you're finding your footing in this new career, drawing right. comics, right? And in places like Comics Journal, all that, there, there's the Give Kirby Back His Art campaign, right. all that sort of stuff. Did you have any feelings about it at the time? Absolutely, like, absolutely. Can, can you talk about that? I would often call Tom and and say, you know, I had I had the the benefit of and the uh, the blessing of being able to call DeFalco and say, what can you tell me about this? You know, that other people didn't have. You know, I said, what what is the deal about this? Because uh, even with, you know, like, like when I talked earlier about, you know, Sal, the, the, the idea that we would bounce Sal off of Thor so I could take it over and stuff, I said, Tom, that's not happening. I, I'm sorry. You know, that kind of, so I was always concerned with that kind of thing. And, of course, it affected me. And so I would call DeFalco and ask him what the deal was. You know, what what's really going on behind the scenes when you're not... You know, when you're not trying to demonize Marvel just to make a case for for Jack, um, what, what's what's the real story on it? And you know, I mean, I heard a lot of things that only made me admire Kirby more. But when when Stan Lee went out to California to run Marvel Productions and became publisher or whatever he was, uh, emeritus or whatever, Jack was offered the same gig at Marvel Productions as the art side of that. You know, they were they were interested in having him go out there and kind of, you know, I guess maybe even because he had had, maybe had he had the experience yet with Ruby Spears and stuff? I don't know. But, but he was offered a similar gig at different times at, with Marvel. I mean, there, there were times. There's no denying that he was treated poorly by management that Stan didn't have the final say in things, and that, you know, they, there's that story about one of the idiots in management saying, what does Kirby do around here? You know, that kind of thing, because obviously that's ludicrous on the face of it. But what I was, try what I was getting to is there were times he was offered positions with Marvel. My, my understanding is he was offered this one, definitely offered this one position out in California as part of Marvel Studios, the same as Stan Lee, and... He turned it down because he wanted to stay working in comics. He was doing the Pacific stuff, I guess, at the time, and still creating his own comics, and and was, you know, very involved and in, in spearheading this creator-owned movement. Where you know he was he was the old guard that was working with a lot of these young guys. It said, "Come on, let's go create and own our own stuff." And you got to admire a guy that late in his career for sticking to his guns. I mean, you know, that to me. That's not a story of Jack being shit on. That's a story of Jack being the guy who says, let's go see what this is like. After all the years of being a company guy, saying, let's go see what, what, the in, what, what independence is like. Let's go see if we can create our own stuff that catches and becomes you know, something huge. I, I love that. I love that about him. That's Kirby to me. That's who Jack is. You know, I mean, he, 
he he was never he was never a company shill. You you know, at no time was he ever a company shill. Uh, he was Jack, whatever he was doing. You know, I mean, he became his own brand, and taking that shot was. I, I could certainly see where he felt he had to do that. You know, and I respect it. I respect it. I do. I wish he had taken a position where he would be more taken care of, or or treated in an emeritus type of way with a stipend and everything. Yeah, absolutely. But that's not what he wanted. That's not what he trusted. So, did you meet Jack Kirby? No, never, never did. I was once. Uh, as as close to him in a room as I am to you guys, but uh, I didn't have the balls to go up and introduce myself. He <laughs> was he was speaking, and it was during uh, you know that particular period of time where they were demonizing Marvel and stuff. I mean, I, I one story I remember very personally was uh, we it was again at San Diego, uh, and it was one of those deals where Jack was talking, and he was older, and he would tend to ramble. And Roz would sit in the front row, and she would try to keep him on point. But he would ramble. And this time it was particularly bad. And I believe it was, I think it was Thibodeau at the time, who we've since lost, I guess. But uh, is that, am I thinking of the right guy? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, he was or was it uh, Theakston? Theakston. We lost Theakston. We lost Theakston. Yeah. yeah, so I, yeah, I'm not sure who this story is about, so I'll leave that out. <laughs> of it. But whoever was handling Jack at the time, it was the only time I saw Tom DeFalco get really, really hot. Because we stood in the back of the room and listened to Jack, and he, we started to become aware of the audience laughing. Oh. Because he was that scattered. You know, you'd ask him a question about creating the Silver Surfer and he would go off on tangents to like, you know, truck drivers to the stars and all this kind of stuff. And, and it was a stream of consciousness stuff that, and it became uncomfortable. And I, I remember whoever the representative was for, for uh, Kirby at that time, Tom took the guy aside after the thing, he called him over to the side and he was standing off in a doorway and I stayed, I stayed the hell out of it. But you, uh, Tom gave him a, a face full and because it was just, what are you doing to this guy's legacy by parading him out here? You know, is, is basically a show pony and, and this isn't, this isn't the best thing for Jack. I mean, I, I remember witnessing one panel discussion where all these young guys, Jack at one point asserts that he hasn't looked at a comic book since like uh, I'm going to pick a number out of my ass, but he said I haven't read a, I haven't looked at a comic book since 1967. And he was on a panel with uh, I'm going to show my my own age, <laughs> Cere Cerebus guy, Dave yeah, Sim, Dave Sim, and uh, you know Gary Groth and a couple other whoever the indie darlings were at the time. <laughs> Along with Dave Sim. And after establishing he hasn't looked at a comic book since like 1967 or whatever it was, Jack went on to, to praise these incredibly creative gentlemen and the work they were doing. And it's like, well, both can't be true, sir. Come on. <laughs> you know, and, you know, and there were, there were like these really unfortunate things. Was it Image that did that? Uh, Phantom Force. Phantom Force thing that... The, the image guys each decided they were going to write a little essay about why Jack Kirby is cool to the idiot 90s kids who were, uh, you know. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, dudes, you know, plus the fact none of them inked him well. I mean, they were all overthinking it, you know, all that kind of stuff. So it was, that was, things like that used to hurt my heart because... I, you know, I, I, I admit, I don't, I don't think Kirby needs anybody to defend him. I, the work speaks for itself. The, the volume of the work speaks for itself. The variety of the work speaks for itself. I'm still fascinated when I see pages from In the Days of the Mob and Soul Love and things like that, that this guy, he was just out there pitching constantly. And there, there's something, uh, individually special about everything he took a shot at 
You know, I mean, there's some real. I mean, there's one of the one of the true divorce stories that he did, like in the seventies or something, where you think he's talking, you think he's talking to his wife, but it turns out it's the mistress was actually more his age. The young girl is the wife, and the mistress is somebody more his the, the guy's own age that he has he's cheating on the young wife with and stuff. It was like amazing stuff. This, I mean. The one thing that Jack always had for all his stylization and everything it was the thing that I was talking about that I value so much. You can read any Kirby comic inked by Coletta or Royer or anybody and you're taken in to the story. I mean, the first Mr. Mir- the first issue of Mr. Miracle just is like laser printed on my brain. Uh, and it was Coletta and it was introducing new characters and new concepts and who is this guy and the, and it just affected me very you know like wow i want to see the next issue of this and the next issue and the next issue and the next issue i was just fascinated with it and i mean the, the and he was just always pitching i mean i i read his captain america stuff now and it wasn't my favorite run of captain america but the number of ideas. Oh, definitely. You know, it's one of the things the Falco always talks about is people come up to him and say, I have this idea for a Spider-Man story. He says, well, then you need to come up with about a thousand more because <laughs> you, you need five ideas for the splash page and then you need, you know. And Jack was that. He was that idealized, What you know, I, I said to Falco, says, we're idea machines. If you hire us, we're idea. Our job is to be idea machines. Jack was an idea machine. I mean, yeah. it, it was just stunning. The amount that he could produce and uh, and different genres and 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 they all had that Kirby approach and yet, you know, how much was he looking at reference for the in the days of the mob or did he just have a photographic memory for every old mob movie he watched or something? <laughs> I mean, the guy was just incredible, just incredible. We've hit about two hours, man, so we should probably wrap up. You okay. got a busy day at the con tomorrow. <laughs> well, I got to finish my list, but <laughs> outside of that. So uh, what what do you have going on these days? Anything you want to promote before we get out of here? Well, absolutely. Yeah, well, two things. One is I do commissions through CatskillComics.com. A gentleman named Scott Fre- uh, Sc- Thanks, Scott. Sorry. Uh, Scott Cress runs it, and he does a fantastic job. He's been my rep for years now, and it's been the best move I ever made. But I'm also working with a gentleman named uh, Darren Henry, who has created a company called Sit Comics. Uh, he has a background in writing situation comedies, and he is combining uh, comic book tropes with like sitcom twists. The book I'm working on is called The Blue Baron. Uh, it's about a uh, uh, 13, 14 year old kid and a superhero in the vein of the Phantom, where it's passed from father to son and people think he might be immortal and all this kind of stuff called The Blue Baron. And there is an accident that they switch bodies. It's Freaky Friday. And now The Blue Baron is trying to survive high school, middle school, and the kid is trying to be a superhero. It, you know, it, and it's a it's a world with a lot of superheroes. He's created this incredible tapestry pretty quickly. Uh, but they play uh, like fantasy football with superheroes, you know, and all this kind of stuff. And they, they all watch the 6 o'clock news. There's the Heroes News Network that talks about the latest superhero battle and everybody wins points in their fantasy superhero league and stuff. And, you know, this kid, Ernie, always wanted to grow up and be a superhero, just not that one, because he's the dorky one that, no, you know, the costume is deliberately uh, a little over the top and based on a, uh, a revolutionary war uh, baron and such. And, uh, you know, so he's the, the staid older superhero nobody wants to be him you know that kind of thing so it's a lot of fun i darren has a very unique voice uh and and he's doing a wonderful job making each of the books uh uh individual with with different voices because he's writing all of them right now blue baron uh he's now bringing in other writers but but he launched all the books himself uh a, a character called startup and a character called uh uh, uh headhunter and, uh, you know, all these books are going to be rolling out. If they haven't already, they'll be rolling out for San Diego this year. But each book has this wonderful individual voice, whether it's a third-person narrator or a first-person narration or, uh, you know, the omniscient narrator of a regular comic or whatever. He's doing an incredible job. I mean, he's obviously a professional writer. Comics is a new medium to him. So, you know, occasionally... 
I'm called upon to, you know, point out that, well, you need three arms in that panel, so we're not going to do it that way, you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> and he's been really open to it. And uh, he actually wanted to hire Sal to pencil the book. And he contacted Sal because he was, he was a comic child of the 70s. And Sal told him, I'm not penciling anymore, but uh, if you contact Ron Friends, I'll be happy to ink it. And luckily, he was familiar with my work on Spider-Girl. So, you know, I, that's, there have been several jobs recently that I've gotten because they wanted to hire Sal. <laughs> but to get Sal, they had to, you know, Sal told them to hire me. You know, I got G.I. Joe work for that reason, and I got, uh, and I got Blue Baron for that reason. So that's what I'm doing. Blue Baron, Sit Comics, sitcomics.net. Check it out. And uh, if you're interested in looking at nice, colorful drawings of superheroes, uh, my commissions are on uh, catscocomics.com. And we'll, we'll put those descriptions uh, in the description below this video. Okay. want to thank you for your time, for participating in our little shoot interview. Man, sitting under the hot lights like, <laughs> like, a, like, a, like a criminal in a Kirby magazine. It's, it's my pleasure. I feel like the old man talking to the young bucks that are going to take over the industry. So, you know. I, and I had to be inter I had to be asked to be interviewed to find out how to pronounce it. So, <laughs> you know, everybody should uh, be a big fan of cartoonist kayfabe. Yeah, we don't like to make things easy for the for our audience out there. <laughs> <laughs> what do you say, Jim? Get out of here. Let's do it. All right, cool. Like, subscribe, follow the YouTube channel, hit the bell icon. It'll notify you whenever we have new videos available. You can pick up Cartoonist Cafe merch in our spread shop. There's a link below this video. The three of us here, we're going to get back to making our comics, but you guys know what to do. Read more comics. <laughs>